Welcome back to Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden. And I am Danielle Hallen. Love it. Oh, with the shoulder roll even. Yes. I hope you're watching that on video. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Danielle, it's November 1st already. Can you believe this? I, you know what? I feel like everyone's so sick and tired of me saying the time is flying by, but it really is. But I'm thankful because it's like one of my favorite months. We're going into the holidays. We all know how I feel about that. I'm such a big Christmas person in particular. What's some of your favorite things that are that are coming up around the holidays? What do you love most about them? Man, being with my family. And I know that sounds so cliche, but I tell my family this personally all the time that if I could build them houses on my property and they just not leave, I oh. would do it. Or if they just want to come and hang out in tents. I'm just like such a big, I love to, I'm so serious. I love being around my family. I love entertaining. I love having people over. And so that's what I look forward to the most. We actually just celebrated Raylan's birthday and I Ooh. was in, oh man, I was in my zone. I made the most amazing skeleton charcuterie board. Awesome. I'm in awesome. my element. This is my element the whole holiday season. <laughs> yeah. Well, as we know from previous episodes with the holidays coming up, not only are we getting ready for them, mm -hmm. scammers and identity thieves will also be getting to work. As a matter of fact, covering crime has made me very aware of personal safety in general. I'm sure you've gone through yeah. the same thing. So literally every few months I go through this maddening process of trying to keep my personal info off of data broker sites. Now these sites can expose anything from your home address to your credit score, your property records, your income, looking at you, Spokio in my life. Those sites are honestly the worst. They take marketing and public records information that usually isn't easy to find and blast it all over the internet using your personal information to make them money. Online criminals also seek out that type of info for taking over your accounts and stealing identities, all kinds of other scams. And what about online harassment, stalking, doxing, the list goes on. I unfortunately have actually been a victim of this where I had someone creepy hanging out around my house a lot and they kept repeatedly sending me pizzas because they knew my address. And being a mother, these are just risks that I can't take. You need a pro on your side and today's video sponsor has you covered. You need OneRep. OneRep is a platform that removes your private info from these sites, which gets your email address, phone number, home address, and more off of Google. OneRep will find the records that have your private information on over 100 people search sites and automatically remove it. Then it checks every month to make sure that your private information doesn't reappear on those sites, which I can tell you from my experience has a tendency to happen. And another great side effect of using OneRep, with your info pulled from all of these sites, you'll notice that you're getting a lot less junk mail and less annoying robocalls. Use OneRep and gain the peace of mind that your private information is staying private. It's like having your own digital bodyguard. Thank you to OneRep Privacy Service for sponsoring today's video. Head to deal.onerep.com slash crime after crime and you will save up to 60% off your subscription. You can also just click the link at the top of the comments below. Lock down your private info right now with OneRep. And a big thank you to them for sponsoring today's video. Now, Danielle, it's time for the results from last episode. Am I acting a little too excited about this? <laughs> Quite possibly. Hint. Hint. I'm trying to ignore it. <laughs> it was for the episode Cruise Ship Crimes. Danielle told the story of a horrible husband who may have planned a cruise on a specific boat to get rid of his wife's body. And I told the story of two young Canadian ladies, nice, nice ladies, mm -hmm that were caught as part of a cocaine smuggling ring while fronting his Instagram fame seekers. How did it play out, Danielle? So on the website poll, I received 32% of the votes and John received 68%. And then on Twitter, I'm gonna have to point out it was a little bit closer, okay, but not. I still didn't, I still didn't <laughs> tip the scales. I received 42% of the votes and John 58%, which means there's no cup exchange, which is fine because I'm in a hotel and forgot my cup. This was the universe telling me. 
<laughs> You're not going to win. Just forget I'm it. Fake <laughs> handing it over to you right now, but I can't. It gets blocked at the I edge. I know. Every single no, time. No cup exchange. Thank you to everyone that voted John last month. I appreciate you guys. Thanks I know. to everyone that voted. Period. Yeah, really. And it was very interesting because after that episode, I actually got an ad for a worldwide cruise. No. And I was like, uh uh-uh. uh. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not being tricked into this. <laughs> no, I am not. It's not happening. That is that is so weird when that happens. And I know yeah. people have talked about this, like, you know, because I have my microphone here. It has a big mute button on the front, yeah. thankfully. So I usually mute it. But every now and then I'll look over and the red light isn't blinking. So it tells me it's still on. Yep. And all of a sudden I'll see ads that I'm like, did I say that in my office? Like, mm-hmm. is no, like it, it, it's not supposed to be happening that way. But I know there's people that swear by it. Like if you talk buy your cell phone about a particular thing like dog food all of a sudden Mm -hmm. dog food ads will show up we all know i'm horrified of cruises i've never looked it up but you better believe that ad popped up and i was like nope (laughs) yeah yeah stop listening in (laughs) well today we've got another great topic for you guys with faked deaths elvis presley jim morrison andy kaufman even Michael Jackson, there have been rumors of celebrities faking their death so they could finally get some peace from their rabid fans for almost as long as there's been celebrities. But what about criminals faking their death? Wikipedia has a list of 37 people who are known to have faked their deaths, and it ranges from murders, evading capture, to a raiding stunt by Vince McMahon for the WWE. Yeah, yeah, they killed Vince McMahon on a TV show, and then everyone was worried that he was... <laughs> no good grief. It's called pseudocide, and according to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, it's been happening for centuries. Unhappy in your relationship? Are you looking to get away from your family? All kinds of reasons, Danielle. <sighs> it seems that frequent side effects of pseudocide are, number one, not thinking about how it affects those close to you, Yep. and, and number two... Not always doing the best planning. How will this cross over with the criminal world? Let's find out with a story from the amazing and talented Danielle Hallen. Well, I can tell you, mine may fall under both of those. (laughs) Both of those side effects may actually occur in this story you're about to hear. (laughs) Mine too. Really? (laughs) See, here we go. Now, you know, faking your own death sounds like something that can only happen in movies. I know Blacklist... Not a movie, but a show. A very good one if you don't watch it. And Six Underground are two of my favorites that kind of showcase this risky choice. But this is, like we mentioned, something that has happened in real life for centuries. People that are hoping to escape prison time, possibly to fill their pockets with insurance money. But unlike the movies, pulling the stunt off successfully isn't actually that common. But those determined to hide apparently find it worth trying with side effects along the way. On February 25th, 2019, a teenage boy frantically called authorities from Monastery Beach, California. He claimed that he and his 57-year-old father were planning on checking in later that night at a local hotel and decided to kill some time at this popular California beach. He said that he was sitting on the shore watching their belongings while his dad headed out to the ocean for an evening swim. But his father never returned to the shore. Uh Uh-oh. Now, you may be familiar with this, John. I am not. I've never even been to California. But apparently, this was not an uncommon call for Monterey County Sheriff's Department. Monastery Beach had apparently earned the nickname of Mortuary Beach. Ooh. I don't know about that. Yeah. I was curious if you would know about it because I've never heard of it. While the beach was known apparently for its beautiful sand, rolling mountainous landscape, the waters are a death sentence really high surf, strong undercurrent. It had the tendency to pull swimmers and divers right over the very steep and abrupt drop off into the ocean. Despite multiple signs posted along the beach warning those tempted to go in the water, the ocean still claimed many victims each year. Mm. So this teenage boy had explained to the officers that he and his father had traveled from another country, making it even more likely that they were unaware of the beach's history. So authorities arrived on site immediately in an attempt to locate this man named Ken Gordon Avis. 
Helicopters were brought in, the Coast Guard, they were searching the waters from above, divers were sent in to search the waters from below. Searchers were also sent out on foot to the nearby mountains that clung to the coastline, just in case Ken somehow managed to pull himself to shore. Time was of the essence here, because not only was the water itself already so dangerous, but it was February. Water temperatures were dangerously low, so drowning wasn't the only fear, but also hypothermia. So it was an emergency. Yeah. Hours passed, the sun was gone, they sent out drones and continued to try to sweep the land and see for any sign of this lost swimmer, but to no avail. But unfortunately, this just sounded like the typical story for Monastery Beach. Swimmers go in and never come out. Monterey County Sheriff's Department decided to bring in Ken's son to question him further and to figure out next steps if his father was never found. Now, Ken's son, who was very oddly calm, claimed that they had come to the U.S. from Scotland on February the 16th, 2019 for a father-son trip. They had spent the previous nine days camping, staying in hotels around the area. He claimed they were between hotels when the disappearance occurred, and he said that his father headed off into the water in just a pair of shorts with a lanyard around his neck holding his passport. Okay. <laughs> this brought authorities to a full stop. Now, while this beach did have a notorious past, so the idea of drowning was very believable, some of these details were odd, to say the least. It was the middle of winter. Many people that did go into the water wore wetsuits. And, you yeah. know, they were still only able to tolerate the cold water for so long. But somehow Ken walked in wearing only shorts. And why on earth would he go into the water with his passport around his neck? You didn't know you need your passport yeah. in the water, Danielle, in Apparently, case you go too far? I know, just in case. You don't <laughs> want to cross any boundaries there and get in trouble. It had been getting dark also around the time that Ken went for a swim, which was just a, another abnormal decision to make. And for the first time in a very long time, the officer said that when they arrived, they were shocked at how calm the water was. <laughs> wow. Trying very hard, probably, not to jump to conclusions, authorities coordinated more search efforts while gathering more answers from Ken's son. But every time they spoke to him, the stranger things became. Authorities wanted to check on how Ken was behaving prior to his disappearance, because at this point, they're like, all right, we need to rule out that this was, you know, somehow connected to foul play was he potentially considering ending his own life? But his son couldn't seem to give any solid answers about anything. He even came out and said that he didn't actually technically see his dad walk into the water. Despite saying that they went camping, he had no camping equipment that he was able to show them. <laughs> he was unable to say where they camped, and when asked about all the hotels, he was only able to name one. And he also couldn't say how they ended up in Monastery Beach from L.A. Jeez. I mean, couldn't say if they took a bus, a cab, nothing. So when authorities finally went to speak to the hotel that he was able to speak about and tell them about, they found that there were never any guests under those names. So confused, obviously, and very concerned about the endless possibilities of why things weren't adding up, authorities finally decided to find Ken's relatives, give him a call, figure out what's going on. Now, they were first told that Ken Gordon Avis didn't actually go by that name. Ooh. His ooh. real name was Kim Avis. Okay. He had flown into Los Angeles International Airport using the other name in an attempt to delay authorities finding out who he really was. Hmm. Why do you ask? Well, maybe because his family gave up all of his secrets that he had been trying to run from. Kim Avis had just been let out on bail in Scotland. He was facing several sexual assault charges on a handful of women and girls in the Highlands, and his trial date was set for March 11th, <laughs> conveniently right after he decided to fly in. So it became very clear that Kim didn't just casually walk into the ocean for a swim and drown. He purposely ran to the U.S. under a different name to a beach known for claiming victims in an attempt to escape prosecution in Scotland. He attempted to fake his death and clearly didn't think it through and roped his son in on it. See, two side effects already coming into play here. 
there's so much like bad thinking going on around this. Like you've got the lack of planning. Yep. You know, um, I mean, did they stay at any hotel? Like, why would you lie about that? Like you stayed somewhere when you were out there. So why not give the accurate information? And this is what's so confusing to me because it it they clearly found this beach. Yeah. So they have that covered. That explains it. But they didn't think like any of these other pieces through. Right. Right. Like, well, and even the thing about using a different name. Yeah. Because if he's trying to pseudocide to kill that particular name and person now he's using a different name for the missing person it's it's weird it's weird it's, it's like, not thought out well at all it's like the fun and i say that very loosely it's like the fun aspects of the crime were thought through but the rest of it it was like flying by the seat of their pants <laughs> and leaving everything on his son to work oh, out exactly ultimately. who's just like oh, i don't know <laughs> i don't yeah. know yeah. So on February 27th, Kim's case was changed from a missing persons to a suspicious circumstance report and was immediately handed over to the U.S. Marshals in an attempt to use better resources to find Kim. Now, authorities began to spread the name Kim Avis along with the name Ken Gordon Avis, as well as photos in an attempt to have the public aid in their search. And sure enough, tips began to pour in. Sergeant Murray with the Monterey County Sheriff's Department said they ended up having to create and assign like a whole unit to handle the sighting calls alone. He said, and I quote, he was like the Loch Ness monster, like Sasquatch. (laughs) Everyone swore they had seen him. I'm telling you. I feel like people see those things and they're like, oh, this is like a manhunt. Let's get in on it. Yeah. Oh, man. So the search for Kim ended up sending authorities to numerous states and countries. It felt like they were chasing a ghost because Kim was always somehow one step ahead of them. Authorities found that he had bounced across at least 10 states in the north and northwest, attempting to evade police. He would never stay the night in the same place twice, and he even began to use disguises once his photo was spread through the media. There are some photos of it. John, it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Good disguises, Daniel. Yeah, uh, questionable. <laughs> <laughs> Things really got tricky when Kim began to hide in the mountains. It began to feel more like tracking a wild animal than a human. But despite chasing all of these leads, not a single one panned out. Kim either moved too quick or it was a case of mistaken identity until March 5th, when they finally got a bit of solid information. A woman had seen photos of Kim circulating the news, and she was shocked because this was a man that she had spoken to in the days just after he faked his own death. The witness contacted authorities and let them know that she had a meeting with him in the Big Sur area, and she handed over everything to authorities. She was able to give them his phone number that he had given her, and she even had his contact name down as the crazy Scotsman. Um, Was this a pretty lady? Was was this a little That's, romantic? I think this may have been what was going on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she even was able to give the description of his car that he had been driving. Whoa. Good for her. I know. She's on it. She is on it, and he's not at all. So (laughs) authorities were able to put a bolo out for his car and hoped that this would be the thing that would ultimately bring him in, but months of silence passed. Things began to slow down. Tips started coming in at a trickle. Authorities had to release his son. They couldn't Mm. really do much. If you really think about it, they technically had no proof that they were able to use you know, they. Well, what would you what would you yeah. hold against the son? Because even his own story is saying that he didn't see his father exactly. actually enter the water. So yeah, Missed if anything's well, if if anything's well thought out here, yeah, it's probably that aspect. Mm. But I can just imagine the frustration that all the investigating agencies had on this because they know his history, they know likely what he's running from, and they just cannot pin anything down. Yeah. But five months after his disappearance, it was clear that Kim began to get too comfortable with his horribly thought out plan. Kim, who had vanished into the water with all of his personal belongings, somehow ended up as mainland as you can get. Colorado. (laughs) After months of no activity, his bank card was randomly used. Authorities went to the last location he was known to be at, but he was already gone Except one thing really did him in, his accent. 
On July 23, 2019, a resident of Colorado Springs called into 911. And while they didn't seem to have any clue that the man they were calling about was wanted for faking his death, they seemed pretty horrified of him. They complained that he there was this, you know, erratically behaving male with a Scottish accent that had been hanging around acting very suspicious. And or a crazy Scotsman. Exactly. <laughs> and then when they dug a little bit deeper, which, you know, is not that deep, given they're just a regular civilian, they found that he was using a fake name. Mm -hmm. So authorities immediately knew they found him. All of this work and his accent and repetitive behaviors had given him away. The witness was able to, again, provide authorities with the photo of a man along with a vehicle he had been driving around the area that matched up to the car he was seen driving on March 5th. <laughs> So by July 27th, Interpol, Scottish Police, Monterey County Sheriff's Department, and the U.S. Marshals managed to track Kim down to a motel in Colorado Springs. They waited for the perfect moment and snagged him while he was walking through the parking lot to his car. He surprisingly went without putting up a fight. Right away, Kim Avis was extradited back to Scotland and was held in prison until his trial. Now, during his trial, he claimed that he ran to the U.S. because he had a near-death experience while out on bail. He okay. Said, I, I know, I know. He said this near-death experience proved to him that he wouldn't get a fair trial when the time came. So I'm wondering if maybe someone attacked him, maybe like a dad or a brother of someone he had sexually assaulted attacked him and he was like, oh boy, or just someone that knew his name. Either yeah. way, he was like, I'm not getting a fair trial. So he decided to run. Now, he even was very open in saying that when they found him at the motel, he did for a minute. He did for a minute consider running again, but he smartly decided that he likely would not get away. Now, the entire trial, he did deny all of the sexual assault charges. He said, and I quote, it's like reading a film script. It's untrue. It is disgusting. Is that your best Scottish accent? Yeah. Oh, good grief. Uh, don't even make me go there. I will embarrass myself and everyone else if I try to do that. But he, I mean, I just found it ironic he would say that when he tried yeah. to fake his own death. That's like reading a film script. Seriously. <laughs> Not but, very well written. No, film exactly. Script. A horrible one. <laughs> Although but, I do have to say, five months on the run. Yeah. Pretty I'm a, good. I'm like a little impressed with that, but I feel like that yeah. is pure luck. Yeah. Yeah. Pure luck. But Judge Lord Sanderson knew better. He said that Avis appeared on the outside to be this great guy. He was actually well known in the town for being a street trader. He would sell jewelry. He made a lot of friends along the way. And he even had received a good citizen award. Mm. But all of that was likely due to his ability to manipulate people and situations. He had a controlling and dominant personality that allowed him to coerce and manipulate his victims from those he assaulted to his own son that ended up becoming a part of his escape plan. His success in the past likely led him to believe that he could fake his death using his manipulation skills and get away with it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, public prosecutor Fraser Gibson said, and I quote, Kim Avis went to great lengths to evade justice for his crimes. Thanks to the efforts of the police and prosecutors working together with U.S. law enforcement, he's finally been brought to justice. He ended up being sentenced to 12 years in prison for 13 sexual assault offenses. And, oh, yeah. And three years for failing to appear to his initial trial in March of 2019 when, you know, he's pretending to be dead. Yeah. While local authorities said that they knew how deadly the water of Monastery Beach was, this was the first time anyone had tried to use it as a ploy. So I think if we all take anything away from this, it's that leave faking your death to Hollywood. Yes. And that's it. <laughs> Point blank. Huge thank you to usnews.com, bbc.com, and New York Times for the information on this case. Mm, man, just not well thought out. Not at all. And that's actually an interesting aspect, too, to think of having such a strong characteristic yeah. as a, you know, a Scottish accent and then mm -hmm. trying to blend in in a different country. Mm -hmm. um, that's, yeah, that's, that's a really tough thing. And so no charges wind up for uh, hitting his son, right? Nope. No yeah. charges yeah. for that. I mean, they, uh, nothing. They couldn't ultimately yeah. really prove anything. Cause I mean, they kind of, that's the one part, like you were saying that they kind of set up 
to work really well. I mean, yeah. obviously didn't go the way they hoped that people would believe that he was dead, but I mean, they weren't able to prove, you know, he could easily say, well, yeah, I went in the water, but I managed to come back out, couldn't find my son, yada, yada. You know, there is a million yeah. ways that that could have gone. So they really weren't able to do anything. It just, but it, it's not a great plan on the no. outset because if, if you go missing in conditions like that, mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's that easy to all of a sudden, oh, well, we need a death certificate. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it, I don't think it just necessarily, I mean, yes, you can get to that point, but it usually is a matter of years to go through all yep. that. And you're playing a really long con at that point yeah. of trying to get to that death certificate. And then once you have that, you know, running it back to Scotland and saying, hey, look, he's deceased. You know, these, these charges can go away. Um I mean, who would have been responsible for handling all that? He's laying that on his son. Hey, Probably. we're going to, yeah, we're going to tie up the next five years of your life trying to get this piece of paper so you can get me off of these charges. Um, yeah. I'm telling you, but it's like I'm saying, people that are desperate. I mean, that's, if you really think about it, even though it was a bad plan, still what was executed took a ridiculous amount of effort. There's also like this component of selfishness. Yep. It's, and it's so strange to think about that because of, you know, considering this term, you know, pseudocide, mm -hmm. um, it, it's so strange to think that, yeah, I'm going to effectively take that old version of myself mm -hmm. and get rid of it um, so that I could build something new. Yep. And just like those points we were talking about, not thinking about the people that are around your life and the not responsibilities you're laying on them mm -hmm. and then lack of planning like crazy. It's just, it almost feels like a fantasy that they've tried to bring into reality exactly without, yeah you know, really understanding it wow Whew. well danielle as we have frequently said on this show uh it's like we share our brain mm -hmm. because there are certainly some components in my story that are going to line up very nicely with yours as a matter of fact there might be a son in my story as well but does he actually know that he's helping a father? Oh, no. Oh, no. That's awful. <laughs> We're going to find out right after this quick break. <laughs> the holidays are upon us, and that means more shopping trips and a big drain on your finances. Before your stress levels rise to the point where you consider faking your own death, first, consider HelloFresh. They get rid of the stressful meal planning and their no contact delivery brings food right to your door with everything needed to pull together a delicious meal in about 30 minutes. What about those big holiday meals? Their limited edition holiday boxes deliver everything you need to cook up a family feast. No planning necessary. Spend more time with your friends and family. And remember, HelloFresh isn't only for meals. Their marketplace features a variety of add-ons for breakfast, desserts, and seasonal snacks like Pillsbury pumpkin cookie dough. Did I say that? Yes, I did. Did some cookie dough come in my last shipment? Yes, it Possibly. did. Possibly. Don't tell my wife. Uh, yes, and Danielle, you got me so pumped up on the hearty black bean and poblano soup. I added it this last time. I literally had it two nights ago, and I have to say, you did not disappoint. That soup is legit. It is great. It's delicious. Even at full price, it's over 30% cheaper than grocery stores. And with this holiday deal, it's time to try for even less. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime14 and use code CrimeAfterCrime14 for up to 14 free meals and three free gifts. Free gifts? Santa's coming early this year. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime14 and use code CrimeAfterCrime14 for up to 14 free meals and three free gifts. Come on. Try America's number one meal kit right now. You won't regret it. Welcome back, everybody. I'm sitting here just chomping at the bit waiting to hear this story. First of all, I'm always so impressed. I feel like we need to create a reward for both of us, like some sort of award that we can manage to every single episode read each other's minds. I know. I know. How does that happen? I have no idea. But once again, similar themes, but a very, very different story. You ready, Danielle? I'm ready. Let's get to it. October 2011, 22-year-old Alkan Vorotinov was shocked by what his mother was telling him. His father, Igor, 
had taken a trip back to Moldova, a former Soviet Republic in Eastern Europe, and had died of a heart attack. Being so far away, Alcon and his mother were actually living in my home state, Minnesota at the time. That added a ton of stress on top of the severe loss that they were dealing with. Thankfully, his mother, Irina, who had actually divorced Igor in 2010, found the strength to make the trip halfway across the world to bring his father home. She soon arrived in the village of Kojunsa, uh, or Kojusna, sorry, uh, where her husband's body was found at the entrance to the small village. The U.S. Embassy provided a representative, and Arena went to the town's morgue, a dilapidated green building that didn't have air conditioning oh, or, no. yeah, or reportedly any type of refrigeration unit. Oh, good grief. After taking, uh, as a matter of fact, it didn't even have a concrete path to the front door. So she's walking through this dirt trail to get to this building. She enters the building and identifies her late ex-husband. Now, I don't think anyone was surprised considering the facility that the body was stored at when Arena elected to cremate his remains and return to the U.S. with his ashes in an urn. Igor's funeral was held in Minneapolis in early November and attended by many. Known well by the local Russian community, everyone mourned the loss of the auto mechanic and car dealer. The family tried to move on. Thankfully, Igor had filed a, and I'm going to try to say this with a straight face, life insurance policy totaling over $2 million just the year before his tragedy. Mm, interesting. And er- and Arena was listed as the primary beneficiary. Wow. I do have to point out his ex-wife. Yeah. Which is kind of an interesting twist. Very interesting. Yeah. I would never sign up for <laughs> life insurance and, and uh, put my ex-wife's name on that line. Uh, <laughs> she filled out the paperwork and soon a check for $2,048,414.09 showed up. And nine cents. And the nine cents, absolutely. absolutely. Can't forget it. It seemed like the cloud of Igor's death now had a silver lining as Arena would wind up fighting breast cancer, having a double mastectomy, going through chemotherapy, losing her home due all to these mounting medical bills all around this time as well. So oh, man. the following June 2012, Alcon took a trip to Moldova. While visiting a family friend at a get-together, he was in for the shock of his life. There was his father. Alive. I, yeah. Hey, I'm going to this little party, family friends. Hi, Dad. His father was there, alive and well. He had reportedly been living in Transnistria a thin strip of autonomous land between Moldova and Ukraine. Uh, I I don't think he picked that on accident, by the way. The laws get very interesting when you're living in an area like that. Okay. Uh, What happens from this point, not exactly known. There's not a ton of detail on it. Now, some think that Alcon might have known about the faked death the entire time. Others aren't so sure. According to statements from Alcon's attorney, Matthew Mankey, quote, he actually had to experience a funeral funeral slash memorial service for his father, only to later find out that his father was alive. Can you imagine your own mother? And she brings an urn back. Then dad shows up alive. What kind of people are these? What kind of people put their own children through that kind of emotional turmoil? And I would be like convinced that I was crazy at first. Like oh, I would walk, I would walk in there and see that and be like, I've lo- it's like okay i've officially lost it like someone yeah. needs to come and help me i would right it would be right. awful you know you're questioning your own sanity you're questioning everything that you've been told i mean that's that's a lot that's a yeah. whole lot and you're still in the mourning process i mean this is yeah. a matter of seven eight months later you know I yeah. mean, you're, you're still carrying this uh alcon returned to the u.s and he kept his father's secret But a year later, the FBI received an anonymous tip. Someone in Moldova actually contacted them, told them to check into a man running around by the name of Nikolay Patoka, and that if they did, 
they might find the recently deceased Igor Vorotanov. While the investigators got to work, Alcon traveled to Moldova for several more vacations. One time his mother went with him as well to celebrate New Year's. In November of 2013, Alcon and his fiance, who is also a Moldovan citizen, mm-hmm. were returning to the U.S. after a visit to Moldova, but they hit a little snag when they got to U.S. Customs. They were detained, and Alcon's laptop as well as other belongings were confiscated. What was found on his laptop were several pictures of his father from earlier that year. Now, if the timestamp wasn't reliable enough, Alcon's fiance had a young daughter, and she was in several of the pictures with Igor. Oh, man. So it was clear. They they knew he's still alive, and now they literally had photographic yeah. proof from his son's laptop. But Danielle, like, yeah, okay, we, you know, insurance money is all pretty straightforward. Mm-hmm. Hold on a second. What about the ashes? What about the urn? Yeah, who in the world is that? Investigators looked back at what had reportedly occurred. It seemed a body was indeed found by a police officer. Mm -hmm. The man was dressed in Igor's clothes. There were no obvious signs of trauma, but the body was already decomposing. The officer enlisted the help of his son to transport the body to the morgue, which a lot of people point out. They're like, what is this? Like, (laughs) cop comes up on a body. Hey, son, help (laughs) help me me. move this. Help me drag this body. Um, at the morgue, a medical examiner determined that the man did actually die of a heart attack and they found several documents on the body that had Igor's name, Mm -hmm. including a list of like contacts, you know, like phone numbers and stuff, hotel cards and his passport. So a bit different where in your story, I was thinking of that passport Mm -hmm. and saying, Mm -hmm. oh, I wonder if he needs it. Like, that's why there's a story yeah, about he, his yeah, exactly. his passport disappearing, because maybe he's going to flee or mm-hmm. jump somewhere else. Here, obviously, Igor had no plan to, to go back. Up, yeah. yeah, give up the passport and make it found with the body. Uh, in court documents, federal prosecutors noted, quote, the manner of this crime's execution was quite sophisticated. We now know that there was really a body found in a field in Moldova. The government executed a search warrant on the urn at Lakewood Cemetery in Minneapolis, And they checked, and it really does contain human remains. Somehow, Moldovan officials were paid to write false reports to make it appear that Igor had actually died. And that's the official conclusion from the federal prosecutors. Now, the insurance company, when the claim was filed, they also hired a a private investigator. Mm -hmm. And uh, he reached out. He interviewed the police officer and the medical examiner. Everything seemed on the up and up, but there was one little thing that seemed a little bit off. When he asked why there was no photos of the body, the morgue employees claimed, because no one had a camera. That's 2011, Hmm. you know, I mean, I think cameras are around a bit at that point, but not that you'd take morgue photos on a cell phone camera, but it's just, it's it's a little weird. But that's- I've heard that in a few other cases and it's never led to anything good. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Um, But that's the only thing that that investigator Mm -hmm. found that was kind of off. Everything else seemed solid. Alcon and his mother were arrested in 2015, even though Igor was still in Moldova enjoying his afterlife. The investigation had found that Arena contacted Mutual of Omaha Insurance Company three days after the funeral, and the money was sent to her on March 23rd, 2012. She apparently had someone else deposit it, and then $1.5 million was transferred to an account in the name of her son, Alcon. And she reportedly instructed him to transfer different portions of it to multiple accounts all over the world, including Switzerland, Hungary, and, you guessed it, Moldova. Now, even though Alcon participated in some of the transactions, it's still possible that he was unaware of the fraud aspect. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, he... There was a life insurance payment. It came his way. His mother told him, you know, deposit this and put it over here. You should probably keep this safe. You know, we're splitting it up to make sure nothing happens. Yeah. Yeah. There's still a lot of question around that. Uh, Igor found out about the charges that were filed against his family and decided he was going to use that brilliant cunning of his to get them out of it. He told Alcon to let him speak with the prosecutors. So Alcon literally hands his phone over to these guys. And Igor tells them this completely unbelievable story. He said that friends of his in Moldova faked his death 
and then kidnapped him in a plan to steal the insurance money from Irina. So Igor and Irina really had nothing to do with it, Danielle. They were both victims in this. He was kidnapped. His wife didn't know. It never ends. Yeah. Now, apparently, you know, he's running the story off to the prosecutors. Apparently, mm-hmm. he didn't tell Arena about oh. this new version of the story. Of course not. <laughs> and the prosecutors believe that once her legal team heard about it and how it was, and I quote, so stupid mm-hmm. <laughs> that That's a it great actually, quote. yeah, <laughs> that it actually led them to change her plea to guilty. Oh st- <laughs> my goodness his story was so stupid that she was like okay i give up i'm just i'm guilty just forget it i'm not winning this like this is over with i have no faith in anything anymore (laughs) this guy i divorce him and then he tells me he's gonna send me all this money and then he's like Uh, no i was kidnapped Yeah, so the investigators did try to talk some sense into Igor when they had him on on the phone. Uh, They asked him to come back to the United States to face what he had done, but he replied to them that he would rather live with his new love interest on a 300-acre apple farm than risk prison in the United States. So he's got his new girlfriend. They're growing apples. He's not coming back. Investigators asked Alcon for his help with the charges against his parents, which he did. He provided in exchange for a lesser sentence. In May of 2016, Arena was sentenced to 37 months in federal prison for one count of mail fraud and one count of engaging in a criminally derived monetary transaction. Her son got three years of probation and 300 hours of community service for concealing a felony. So Igor was federally indicted on one count of mail fraud, but seemingly just went on with his life. Until 2017, when he was arrested in Transnistria, based on an extradition order from the United States, he was handed over to Moldovan authorities. But you know Igor, he doesn't back down from a challenge. Absolutely not. He petitioned the United Nations for asylum. And while they were reviewing that request, he was released. And when he was released, he slipped away from Moldova. Why would they release him? Like of anyone that's a possible flight risk of anyone. Part of the process. Just no, we're going to process this. Go ahead. Let him out. We're going to have, you know, court hearings and stuff. He's going to have to show up to the court hearings. Well, I can just was... picture him like giggling and like running like, ha, yeah, gotcha. With apples <laughs> apples and his gotcha. new girlfriend. <laughs> uh, they had three court dates for his asylum appeal to be heard. And he claimed... Uh, I'm too sick. Can't show up. I'm I'm too sick. Finally, on November 14th of 2018, he was sent arrested again, and he was finally extradited back to the United States. Now, once he got here, he's he's done this scam before, right? Mm-hmm. He requests bail, but it was denied by the judge, Good. who said that he showed quote substantial resourcefulness and cunning. Mm-hmm. She must have heard about that crap he pulled back in Moldova. Yep. Uh, After pleading guilty in July of 2019, at the age of 55, Igor was sentenced to 41 months in prison. But what about the money? Yeah. The family was ordered to pay it and a little bit more back. A grand total of $2,056,554. And I bet that nine cents is in there too. Is owed in restitution. Alcon's attorney believes that due to his mother's illness, Alcon is probably going to have to pay back the bulk of the restitution. Oh, man. Quote, he will likely be paying off Mutual of Omaha his entire life, Matthew Mankey stated. Of course, Igor can start growing some apples when he gets out in another year or so. Yep. Uh, When the Justice Department was asked by the press how Igor acquired a body, they responded... We have no idea. And to date, there has been no news on any developments in terms of whose remains are actually sitting in that urn. Good grief. Like, Big thing. Oh, go ahead. No, I'm just over here and I, all I can think about is I'm like, how did that? I mean, either that's great timing or, you know, like, how did he just so happen? Like, does this person not have a family? I mean, has anyone looked into yeah. it? 
I don't. Well, and I don't know if you can do um, like any type of DNA testing yeah. on cremains. I don't know if that actually I don't know works. Um, but yeah, you you would think there's a family that's missing yeah. their, their loved one. And outside of that, there might be some angle around. Uh, I mean, it seems like the federal prosecutors were pretty convinced that there was funny play that was going on yeah. with the, the mortuer and the cop over there. Um, maybe this was a natural death. I mean, if, if the death determination is accurate, some guy had a heart attack out uh, there. Yeah, they're like, here, use this one. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But um, yeah, still, still a big question, mm-hmm. and sucks that his remains aren't with his family. Or, yeah, exactly. You know where they would be. Big thank you, Washington Post, Associated Press, NPR, Patch.com, Justice.gov, TwinCities.com, and the Star Tribune for information contributing to today's story and the lesson danielle don't bring pictures of your dead dad back home on your laptop yeah probably not a great idea yeah. but see something about that though makes me feel like he really didn't know you know yeah. and that almost makes me feel like he took them because he's like i need proof like i need this to know and remember that this didn't happen to him and he's not dead and he is alive it is the question it's the big question in this case um because Alcon, uh, you know, I, I kind of looked into him a little mm-hmm. bit. Um, it just, it seems like for him to have flipped on his parents and essentially helped the prosecution, uh, I, I just, I have a feeling that there was aspects he yeah. didn't know about. He was he did, angry. Yeah, he did get to know about it and then he kept quiet. Yeah. Um, which obviously, you know, that was, that became a charge in itself. Mm-hmm. But um, I don't know. I just, I'm not. I'm not getting a very strong feeling that he was aware of this. Maybe I'm being naive, but it's already a strange condition when you have a man lining this up with his ex-wife. There's just, there's a lot. And even that I'm wondering, like, did they process the divorce on purpose? Was that some other effort to try to hide the track of the money or the traceability? Exactly. But, you know, you've got this guy running off to another country and then having a new girlfriend out there. So apple um, trees. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but but then his ex-wife, you know, goes out to visit also at the end of 2012 is when she was out there for that New Year's celebration. This so is weird. It is. It's so <laughs> it's like really it's, weird. Yeah, yeah. Um, and unfortunately, th- there was a ton of articles about it, but the level of detail just had this kind of like it only goes this far and it doesn't go any yeah. deeper. You know. Um, so I literally, you guys heard every single detail that I could find on this story. Yeah. Um. Man, and, and if he just... if he wasn't involved too, and he's now having to pay off the majority of that, whoo, sucks. Yeah, and you're wondering, like, hey, that apple farm, like, is part of the money yeah. in the apple farm? Like, where where I is sure the hope money? So. <laughs> right, right. Like, yeah, you guys moved it to all these different accounts and all mm-hmm. that. Well, guess what? Now your son is seemingly screwed over, and maybe maybe this is brilliant. Maybe there's some aspect to that where they were like, hey, Alcon. Send yeah. the ten thousand dollars a year or whatever they want. You know yeah. that's only going to cost us <laughs> whatever X amount of money over its lifetime, and we're still going to make out with an extra million on top of that. I don't know. I don't know. Oh boy. So that was a it's good nutty. One. Do you like that one? Yes, that was a good one. I like. It's very interesting to me how many times he tried to stick with his story. Like he was super determined to stick with it. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and the aspect that I was really hooked by was like, they got a body, like they faked their death. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, identity theft is one kind of thing. Like they stole a body yeah. and then put his identity on that person. Mm-hmm. And he was just out there living his best life. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. nothing was going on. Growing oh apples, goodness. Danielle. Yep. Mm-hmm. The apple grower. <laughs> yep. All right. Who is ready for some extra stories? We've got a few. We've got a few. Might be some other similar themes, but I think a few that are different as well. Um, I'm going to kick off this part of the party. It didn't look good, Danielle. In 2008, police found a BlackBerry smartphone, jewelry, and credit cards belonging to attorney William Groth in a plastic bag in front of his home. Later that night, his car was found at a park near a boat ramp. Search and rescue operations were launched. His wallet and hat were found on the riverbank, and his jacket was found in the river. Police were suspicious that every item they found 
either had his name right on it (laughs) or was easily identifiable as belonging to him. But then came the phone call. A man called the authorities saying he wanted to confess to the robbery and accidental killing of growth. The murderer, Danielle. The murderer called the police. This when checks Willie... out. <laughs> it totally checks out. Yeah. No, the murderer called it in. So like, I killed this guy. Dang, I made a mistake. <laughs> when William's family heard the call, they were really surprised. I mean, first of all, how often does a murderer mm-hmm. call in a confession? But there was another twist. Mm, doesn't that sound like William? Oh, no. <laughs> Danielle. William called in as the murderer that killed himself. (laughs) You know, technically he's not lying. (laughs) Kind of, kind of not. And believe it or not, he uses that as kind of part of his defense about what happened. Are you serious? (laughs) He essentially says that he just went through this big emotional breakdown. Oh, no. And that he, you know, part of it was he really was kind of killing the old Mm -hmm. William. Uh, law enforcement did eventually catch up with him. He actually wasn't leaving a very hard path to follow, as opposed to your story, Danielle, where, you know, there's no hotel and mm-hmm. corroboration doesn't happen. Yep. In this story, he checked into a hotel using his wife's maiden name <laughs> and motel staff easily identified him. Now, why, why, William? Why would you have done all this? Well, he was having an emotional breakdown and... He also had a few multi-million dollar insurance policies. (laughs) Mainly the mental breakdown, but... (laughs) But, yeah, there was this other thing. He pled guilty to attempting to defraud his insurance companies and was given five years probation with 32 hours of community service worked each month. And he had to pay back $13,000 to cover the costs related to the search efforts for him. Good. Yeah. That's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, I feel sorry for him if he was having an emotional breakdown, but something tells me that wasn't a lot of the motive behind it. Maybe, but I mean. Yeah, this is one that, um, you know, I was kind of looking into and thought maybe I could do the fuller story on it. There just, there wasn't enough, but it was almost in a way where I was like, I'm wondering if people are starting to delist some of the stories and stuff like that because. Probably. He, yeah. Well, but he seems like, he seems like a guy that just had a bad run for a little Mm -hmm. bit you know like i it wasn't quite as malicious like you know look at igor and all the stuff that igor was trying to pull let's take a body yeah you know i think there's that line we kind of touched on it earlier Mm -hmm. in this episode of this is a fantasy like what if couldn't it wouldn't it be amazing if Mm -hmm. and then some people try to implement elements of that i think william was like at step one and then just like oh my god this is out of control and just back yeah exactly Igor was down the road around the block growing apples with his girlfriend. Yeah, like planning a whole lifetime ahead of him ready to go. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) it was done. Like the planning in that was just so, so out there. Well, you know, I can see that though. Emotional breakdown, you kind of want to get away. But the one that I'm about to tell is probably the most bizarre reasoning for wanting to fake your death. It wasn't for money. What? Or to evade crimes. Well, hold on. There's three. There's always three, right? It's for. It's either for power, mm-hmm. money, power, sometimes lumped together. Mm-hmm. Um, Man, what's that other one? M- well, there's money. Love? Maybe. Love? A- apparently. Uh-oh. Alexi. Sweet Alexi. Wanted to impress his girlfriend. By pulling off probably the craziest proposal that I've ever heard of. So Alexi decided that he was going to fake his death in order to impress his girlfriend. He used a well-known makeup artist, a screenwriter, and a director to stage an entire car accident. His makeup was done to make him look horribly injured as he laid in the middle of the road when his girlfriend arrived hysterical after she was told by the paramedics that her beloved boyfriend had died while in (laughs) did you like that (laughs) what the almost the f word almost came out of me i'm just like what are you picturing i just picture it playing out and i'm just like no no it has to stop 
You paid someone to tell your girlfriend that you died. Mm -hmm. And while she's in hysterics. What the? He magically revived himself. Do you know what he had? He had balloons. He had flowers. And he (laughs) thought, this is my moment. And he proposed. Now, he explained that he was trying to get the point across that his life would be empty without her. And so she said yes. And while no criminal charges were technically made, I am very concerned for the both of them. Yeah, yeah, I would be too. <laughs> I am very concerned. <laughs> I, I, It's weird because at the start when you were talking about the conditions of setting this up, mm-hmm. I was thinking like, Oh, is he going to save a baby from a burning building? Yeah, <laughs> like, just is like, he trying uh, to impress her? Yeah. Like, no, he's what? like, perfect. I'll be dead. Yeah. Yeah. No, she'll think I'm dead. And then, yeah. uh, I mean, it, do you do you think that was done in some effort for him to mitigate her saying no or something? Or like he was I unsure? I was just about to say that. Yeah. I was yeah. just about to say that. Like, oh, let's get her in this state of just emotional overwhelm. Right. And to where, you know, she feels like she can't say no. Right. Like she wishes that I was back. And then in that moment of not knowing the reality, mm-hmm. I'm going to say, will you marry me? <laughs> I know. Sneak it in there just real quick. And then hopefully we'll get a yes. This is like my nightmare. Like I've never understood like the flash mob proposals. I think they're so sweet. But like I would be horrified. Yeah. And if my yeah. boyfriend proposed to me. After getting in a car accident, I'd fight. <laughs> That's uh, yeah, the only I, words I can come up with. I'd fight. I am pretty sure if I would have tried this proposal mechanic myself, that I would be single right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Chances fairly are. confident. Yeah, I'm fairly confident. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty, pretty sure. Some people like surprises, I guess. Yeah. Uh, what a nice surprise if you like surprises. Yes, oh, that's a great surprise. <laughs> my boyfriend's not dead. He just stood up with blood and scars all over him. And you know he's what? holding a ring. I really bet there are quite a handful of people that would love that. Yeah. Oh, sure. I, just I'm not- just worried by it. <laughs> all right. We got one more, Danielle. 2019, New South Wales, Australia. Authorities were called in when a man reported his twin brother missing. Mm -hmm. There might be similar themes here, Danielle. Mm -hmm. There might be another one. (laughs) The man said he was supposed to meet his brother at the beach, but when he got there, all he found was his brother's clothing and some personal items. Witnesses stated that they did see a man matching that description, go for a run and a swim. A massive search effort ensued. Marine rescue groups were helping out. Helicopters were sent out to look for him. But by day three, things were looking pretty grim, except for one little tiny fact. The man didn't exist. (laughs) No wonder they couldn't find him. (laughs) Yeah, the man did not exist. Police in New South Wales issued a statement claiming inquiries determined the report was false and there was no missing swimmer. The man that called in his missing twin was apparently trying to get out of debts that he didn't want to pay off. Now he also has to face charges of filing a false police report and costing them approximately 1 million Australian dollars in their search efforts. Danielle, they had helicopters, boats, people, Three days of this, they're scouring, looking for this guy that doesn't exist. You know, he didn't do much for his debts. No, not at all. (laughs) Not at all. Could you imagine being like, man, you know what? This is solving all of my problems. Yeah. Couldn't. Isn't there some way I can get that credit card paid off? (laughs) No. No, it's not worth it. My goodness. I'm telling you, it's that desperation factor. It seems to come in every single time. That's perfect. That's a perfect phrasing for it. Desperation fantasy. That's what this is. It's a desperation fantasy. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, with all that said, who's going to win this month? We can vote. We usually vote for each other, but we leave it up to you guys. You get to vote who told the best faked deaths story. That's right. And you can vote on the Twitter account over at at CrimeAfterPod for the first seven days after the episode drops. Or 
You can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and vote there. We also have a link in the description box below, or you can click the little letter I up in whatever corner of the screen. Still haven't figured that out yet, and it'll take you there. At crimeaftercrimepodcast.com, you can find all the links you'll ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to suggest show topics, join our Patreon, or shop our Teespring store. And as always, a huge, huge thank you to our patrons. We adore you guys. You guys get a bonus Patreon special segment monthly. We've been super into Would You Rather games over there. It's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Plus, the patrons get a personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special. And next episode, uh, we got the holidays coming. It's going to drop on December 1st. Danielle and I will be telling you two stories about real life Grinches. I'm excited. This can go so many different ways. I'm excited too. But I think somehow we're going to find similar themes. Yes, we are. (laughs) We are. I don't know how it happens. I'm telling you someone needs to create an award. There's got to be something. Someone who knows like psychology, let me know what's going on here. There you go. The brain link award. (laughs) I know. Perfect. (laughs) (laughs) This podcast is produced and hosted by myself, Daniel Hallen, and the amazing John Lorden. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. And the best way that you can help others find us Tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone you love crime after crime and they should check it out. See you guys next time.